people would be afraid to go places uh, where there would be people, parks, uh, movie theaters, places where there'd be a lot of people congregating were the scary places to be because that's where you could catch it. I don't know if I even knew what it meant, but everybody knew the word. Polio, a disease transmitted by virus, formerly called poliomyelitis, struck repeatedly during the first half of the 20th century, killing thousands, crippling tens of thousands more. Most of its victims were children. There is no disease today like polio. Everybody was afraid of it. We lived with a disease that could strike anybody at any time, and there was not much you could do about it. When polio struck, quarantine often was recommended to contain it. A family home would be isolated, or a neighborhood, or even an entire town. Communities also quarantined themselves in the mistaken belief that they could keep polio out. Some areas undertook still more aggressive measures. Literally tons of DDT are used on this dread disease that attacks our young. Seemingly, nothing could prevent the mysterious disease. Nothing could cure it, and very little was available to treat its symptoms. The iron lung, an artificial breathing machine, saved victims whose chest muscles had been paralyzed. Many spent the rest of their lives entombed. If recovery did occur, the patients were transferred to a rocking bed, moving like a seesaw, it used gravity to force air in and out of weakened lungs. For some, nothing remained of the polio once the virus had run its course. But for many others, there remained permanent reminders of its attack. There was only one course of action to stop these devastating effects, to prevent the disease altogether. Laboratories around the world conducted a relentless search for a polio vaccine. A vaccine works as a preventive strike against a disease, even one as easily spread as polio. It took decades for scientists to discover that the contagion occurred through hand-to-mouth or person-to-person -person contact, as well as through food and water. Meanwhile, the disease raged. In 1931, there was an epidemic in New York City. In 1932, in the massive states of New Jersey and Pennsylvania and the city of Los Angeles. The late 1930s brought a few field trials for polio vaccine. All failed, some disastrously. Eighteen years later, Dr. Jonas Salk worked up a trial vaccine made from killed virus. It was time, he announced, to stop testing the vaccine on chimpanzees and start testing it on children. Everybody knew somebody who had had polio. Polio just hit. There was nothing you could do about it, and it hit a lot of children. The epidemic spread through the Western Hemisphere, 1948 in Mexico, and in the early 1950s in Cuba and El Salvador. In 1952, the USA saw its worst polio epidemic yet. 58,000 cases of paralytic poliomyelitis reported one severe case for every 3,000 people. Later that year, Dr. Salk began testing his vaccine on several hundred children, children and families of neighbors and friends. There were no bad reactions. The next step, a national field trial. In the spring of 1954, the Salk polio vaccine was tested on two million children between the ages of six and nine. I was a polio pioneer because we were the first wave to get the vaccine. It was like a miracle came. It was like one day there was a fear of polio and the next day there was wonderful news. The vaccine had come. We were the first group to get it. A major medical hurdle was crossed with the discovery by Dr. Jonas Salk of the anti-polio vaccine. The trials were over. The results were in the Salk vaccine worked. On April 12, 1955, after decades of searching, millions of dollars, and millions of deaths and paralysis, Dr. Jonas Salk gave the world a priceless gift, 
the first effective polio vaccine. Now everyone could immunize their children against the crippling disease. And there was more to come. Dr. Albert Sabin, another prominent research scientist, came forth with a different vaccine for polio. This one made from a live virus that had been weakened in the lab. Now Dr. Sabin needed a large population of children to test his virus. Since the majority of children in the United States had already been immunized with the Salk vaccine, Dr. Sabin turned to a country with an even larger population, Russia. 1957, the Russians dazzled the world with its satellite Sputnik. But back on land, they were overwhelmed by an invisible alien, polio. Four and a half million people took the Sabin vaccine orally, soaked in sugar cubes. In 1959, the final results were announced. Like the Salk vaccine, the Sabin vaccine was almost 100% effective. Within a short time, it became the vaccine of choice throughout much of the world. The biggest drawback? It had to be maintained at near freezing temperatures from the time it left the lab until moments before it was administered. The cold chain method of transporting the vaccine was developed. As soon as the vaccine was shown to work and could be produced in sufficient quantities, it was put to use. In Antioquia, Colombia, Church and community leaders joined hands to vaccinate more than 135,000 children for the first time. In Toluca, Mexico, circulation of wild polio virus stopped after a single round of mass vaccination. And when Cuba implemented mass campaigns nationally in 1962, polio disappeared from that country within a year. Many years later, during El Salvador's civil disturbances, Days of tranquility were negotiated through UNICEF and the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO. Under the observation of both armies, children were immunized on national immunization days. By 1985, millions of children were already receiving the oral vaccine through the expanded program on immunization. The Pan American Health Organization, with the direct support of Rotary International, as well as USAID, the Intra-American Development Bank, and UNICEF announced a bold step. We are making great strides for the future. The eradication of poliomyelitis in the Americas by 1990. This ambition was inspired by an earlier PAHO achievement, the eradication of smallpox in 1971, making it the first region in the world to do so. The strategy to eradicate the disease had to be two-pronged, to immunize 80% or more of the region's infants, and then to watch diligently for any cases of paralysis which might be due to polio. Three major factors contributed to the eradication of polio in the Americas. Very high level of commitment from the governments, uh, very good interagency coordination, and a sound strategy based on national immunization days with oral poliomyelitis vaccine and epidemiological surveillance. This is the strategy that today is being utilized for the global eradication of polio. With an immunization system in place, surveillance became the means to determine the status of wild polio virus. Where was it? How did it get there? And where might it go next? In 1991, it appeared that the Americas were about to reach their goal of eradicating polio. And then came a call from Peru. A two-year-old boy named Fermin from a town called Pichinaki had been diagnosed with polio. The medical community was shocked. For several years, it had waged a relentless campaign to immunize every child in the area with the oral polio vaccine. Breaking the chain of transmission and determining the extent of the outbreak had to be accomplished quickly. We couldn't find any trace of recent cases or new cases or even a related case to that one in Pichinaki. The hunt for the polio virus intensified. Healthcare professionals conducted a painstaking search for any case of paralysis in children under 15 years of age that had occurred in the past year. Health center records were scrutinized, 
where centers had closed, health workers went door to door to interview mothers and children. At the same time, a massive immunization campaign was launched. The campaign accomplished vaccination of 2 million people in almost 891 districts. The personnel of the health ministry made great accomplishments under tough conditions, but we had good coverage, about 100 percent in children under five. To determine if any wild virus was circulating in high-risk areas, over 200 stool samples from healthy children were analyzed. No wild polio virus was found. To this day, PAHO coordinates an extensive polio surveillance system with over 20,000 reporting units throughout the Americas. None of the cases of acute flaccid paralysis reported and investigated since August 1991 have been poliomyelitis. Now the rest of the world is following PAHO's lead. Here's what the world polio situation looked like in 1988. In these areas, polio still existed. By 1992, the global picture had changed dramatically. 110 countries reported no polio. Countries within these zones or bordering them are the highest priority for action in the near future. Heroic efforts are now underway to immunize children in those areas. In China alone, 100 million children were immunized in two days. But even though individual countries have eradicated the disease, they are still at risk as long as polio exists anywhere in the world. And they still must pay to protect themselves until the entire world is certified polio free. The USA, for example, spends more than $105 million a year on polio vaccine, plus the cost of administering it. When the world is certified polio free, the total cost of global eradication will be saved in just a few years. No country or no group of people stands alone in the fight against polio. In the Americas, the successful eradication of smallpox and polio is only the beginning. The attack continues against other preventable childhood diseases. The achievements of this region should encourage other countries in their continuing battles against polio and the commitment of its citizens inspire them to attain the same goals for their children, for their future. I think the vaccine, as much as it saved the children, it saved the mothers from worrying all the time. I can't imagine having that fear for my children.